Hi there, come right on in. Welcome to Home Keepers. We are so glad to have you today. It's always good that we can connect. You know, sometimes we wonder, okay, where is the connection? Is it in your home? Is it on your phone? Is it on this? Is it on this? There are so many uh, ways that you can see Home Keepers, and I'm so thankful for any way you join us. You are so welcome. And I think that this is going to be a program that will educate you in a way you were not expecting when you tuned in. I have a return guest today. Her name is Renee Mink Crosby. We were trying to think probably it's been four or five years since she was here and a lot uh, has happened to her. And I would just say she's a very triumphant person. And you, if you didn't see her before, you will get to know her. But we're going to talk about a book she's written. It's called The Fringe, A Secret Society. And she has become an advocate for the homeless. And boy, I, I felt so convicted because that's a group. You, well, first place, a lot of us never encounter them. Uh, it's easy to walk past. And this book educated me. I, I learned things here that I never, ever knew existed. And she has put it all together in a small book. I'm anxious for you to meet her. I'm anxious for you to know what this part of our society is all about. In this book, she tells us that one child in the United States out of every 30 is homeless. And you might be interacting with people who are homeless and you don't know it. So we're going to just pull the covers back, put a spotlight on something that is very, very important. And I'm so glad that Renee is back with us. I'm going to join Stephanie. We're going to make pineapple fried rice. And I love... I love Asian food. It is my belief that Asian food is either good or bad. There's nothing in between. So I'm hoping that this will be a really uh, good dish. And for you who watch the budget, this is a good way to kind of, you know, stretch the meat in the budget. And we'll put that together for you, and then we'll let you know if we like it. Uh, before I join, though, you know, do you ever just go cleaning out your closet? I do that pretty often, actually. I take stuff to the Salvation Army. I was cleaning out a closet. And I found these books, Retirement Clues for the Clueless. And I offered this years ago, because this program's been on the air almost 20 years. Can you believe that? Um, and I thought, well, I think I'll offer this again. It, it looks, you know, and the title would suggest it's got a little levity and a little humor. But actually, it's got some great stuff in it. And I only have a few leftovers I can't get anymore so the first people who order it will receive it and I'm sending it for any amount to the program uh, when you send uh, you know you purchase a book or just send an offering it all goes to keep this program on the air so um, I hope the Lord moves on your heart to send a really good offering but the 800 number is there and you just tell them you want the book on retirement okay and you can use the 800 number or you can write to us at Homekeepers Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida 33758. And uh, we will get it out to you. It covers so many topics uh, underneath that subject of retirement. So uh, take advantage of it for those that we have left. And I've joined Stephanie over here. Do you guys ever think about retiring? Uh, oh, sure. Uh -huh. Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see retirement in the Bible, though. I would say it's more for the, the you know, kind of more the uh, closing years in your life to make sure you got enough money to see you through it. That's, yes. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what it's all about. Mm -hmm. What are we doing here? Okay, so I had chicken. We needed to take a short shortcut, so we cut we cooked the chicken up already. Okay. Yeah, so and those were just cooked. tenders. Just uh, tenders. It calls for chicken breast, but. Yeah, and, and you're right, a great way to spread the budget out to yeah. for meat. So I have a half a cup of carrots. I have a half a cup of onions in here. We're just going to saute them up. Do you agree with me on the uh, Asian food? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's either good or it's bad. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No middle ground with it. Nope. I, this smell, the sesame oil smells so good. I think it's going to make the dish. Yeah. Have you ever had used sesame oil? I've not oil? used it, no. Yeah. Mm -mm. Shall we tell our secret? I don't okay. know. Well... <laughs> 
Is it my secret? No. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Remember when I came back and I'd done some grocery shopping? Yes. And I said, that's too expensive. Not going to do it. Not for one tablespoon. Yeah. Got to watch God's money here. Yep. Well, then I had to go out this morning and found some on sale. So. Yeah. Yep. So you got it. And so it's I kinda... stuck my finger in it and I can like see. It, right? I can see where it would enhance so many different dishes. This is red bell pepper. Mm. Uh-huh. No. She doesn't like <laughs> bell pepper. She's been complaining. I'm smiling through it. She's I hit no. No. I'm smiling through it. Yeah. Well, you're brave. <laughs> I'm, I'm proud of you. I didn't say I was going to taste it. <laughs> Well, see, I thought you could tolerate the colored ones. You don't like the green ones. Well, you she know, keeps when, changing. When them. I cut it this morning, the smell of it was just like. Does this go in there? No, ma'am. Oh, okay. Now I have canned pineapple. Mm -hmm. Yum. Yeah, this is going to be good. Yeah, and I have, dun da da da, uh -huh. real bacon. bacon. It's real. <laughs> you didn't get the fake stuff. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> Not on this show. Well, you've done turkey bacon before that made no <laughs> sense to me whatsoever. So we're just going to saute this up. We have a half a cup of frozen peas, and we have rice that we've already cooked. Mm -hmm. So I just need a minute to heat this all up. I think this is going to be delicious, really. Yeah, um, I, I'm sure our viewers who are very, very sharp uh, have noticed the flavors going into this thing. Yes. And uh, this is going to be, oh, we're only I smell the bacon. Mm -hmm. I smell the pineapple. OK, let's put some peas in here. Those are frozen. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> they, they were, were frozen at, at some time. At one time, they were frozen. <laughs> I'm going to put the chicken back in here. Mm -hmm. This is, and this is a lot of food. Yeah. So you can feed a it, lot. It for really a is a one dish meal. I'm going to put okay. some rice in here. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like soy sauce. And then we have soy sauce and we have set the sesame oil. I'm not going to put all that rice. No, it, uh, but you certainly could to spread them. To spread yeah, it. and if you have a big family, just keep throwing, throwing the rice Throw, in there. Keep throwing the rice in. Okay, soy sauce. Mm -hmm. And sesame I oil. Think that it, was three tablespoons. This is one tablespoon. I just been thinking that Arthelene oh. might take some of this home. Oh my gosh, time. that smells so good. Yeah. I'm glad that was on. You better sale. put it put it to the side, someone, mm -hmm. because there may not be any left for you to take. Yeah. To dinner. yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, just give me a minute. Color. Spread it around, and then yeah, let it just kind of mm -hmm. hang out a little. Look how bit. beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This looks like it came from a restaurant. Come on now. Well, who was I talking to this morning? You just had a birthday party for your daughter. Yeah, 21. 21. She was five years old when I started here. Oh, that's here. what I was trying she to She was in kindergarten, and she's 21. You know, that's one thing about... I blinked. That's, that's one thing happened. about CTN, Christian Television Network. People come to work here. They stay a long time. They never leave. We never <laughs> leave. How long have you been here? 100 years, yeah. right? No, I'm going to be <laughs> honest with you. I did all the music. My background is music. For the fundraising banquets, starting in 1977, we went all around Central Florida, and I had put together a musical group, and we provided the entertainment. 1977, I was nine years old. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went on the air in 79. Yep, October of 79, and you've been here every, I pretty think, much every day since. Well, when you take in the 77, mm -hmm. Uh, the only person really been here longer than me is Bob. Right. I wasn't the first employee. No. But I've okay. Been here. You ready? Uh huh. Oh my gosh! If I wish you all could smell this. Yes. Okay, I'll try it because it smells so good. I wasn't gonna because it had red peppers. In oh it. brother! Let me make oh. sure I get a bite without red peppers. I'm telling you. That's the best chicken stir fry I've ever mm -hmm. had. There are mm. no words. Oh, awesome. Darn it. Oh, yeah. Got it. There. Presentation. <laughs> <laughs> she is so particular about that presentation. All right. I promise you, you want this. Oh, the my gosh. information is coming up on your screen as to how to get so it. So good. You can get it through the social media. You can write to us. And it is called Pineapple Fried Rice, and we'll recognize it. So uh, catch that information, and then I want you to meet my wonderful guest, Renee Crosby. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, you may send your email request to artheline at rippy.org 
or you may write to us at the address on your screen, and in doing so, please include a self-addressed stamped envelope. We thank you for being a part of our Homekeepers family. I am so pleased to have a return guest, uh, Renee Mink Crosby, and multi-talented girl. And uh, when I heard from her, because she moved to Denver a few years ago, um, she sent me this book. And is this your first book? Second. Second. What was the other one? Soup Kitchen for the Soul. Oh yeah. Yeah, yes. we talked about that. Yes, didn't we? we did. Well, welcome back. Thank you. And. I'm a Colorado girl. I was born in Fort Collins, and my dad pastored there mm -hmm. and Pueblo and Denver. Mm -hmm. And I uh, graduated from high school there before the whole family moved away to another church in Missouri. And uh, boy, I can't tell you how much I love Colorado. I know. We're kindred spirits that way. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm disappointed in, in their marijuana thing. Um, well, Florida's starting to follow the trail. I know. It. I know. So, it. Yeah. And, and yeah. It's awful because I've read that your, your um, DUIs are way up, emergency room, mm -hmm. and kids getting a hold of it. Yes. yes. And we've had health experts on here. Kids that take marijuana very young, it, it changes their brain forever. Ever. It won't forever. come back. That's right. And I've read those things about Colorado, and I thought, I shouldn't have left. Maybe I could have stopped <laughs> you that. You could have stopped it. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Um, what was it that got you interested in the homeless? Your book so took me by surprise and it yeah. convicted me. Uh, but more than that, it educated me. That was the hope. That would, that's the ultimate hope of the book mm -hmm. is to educate people. How'd you get involved or interested in that? You call it a fringe society. Yes. Enough to, look, to write a book about it. It is. It's a fringe. It's they are so on the edge of um, right in the midst of who we are. I mean, you could be a mother at a playground with your children playing in a small community like where I used to live. And having served in this soup kitchen, uh, knew this mother was um, attending this soup kitchen with her children and staying in the 12 room, 12 bed dorm. And it was the only 12 beds available in the whole panhandle in Florida. Uh, and I knew she was staying there, but otherwise you would never know. So you were, you were volunteering at a soup kitchen? I was. So that's where a lot of this started was I was volunteering in a soup kitchen and just kind of started hanging out there and loving these people and uh, getting to understand their stories and who they were and where they came from and organizing some events there like a big Easter dinner instead of always the traditional Thanksgiving dinner that people serve at a soup kitchen. We did an Easter dinner and getting to know these people and uh, really getting to understand some of the conditions of how they got there, how they might get out and, and kind of like encapsulated in the book, all the different facets mm -hmm. that feed into this homeless problem that we have. Well, in the, in the book, um, you re there's several different kind of types, as I understood it. Um, what is what would you say most people conception of, of the homeless? I think there's the the stereotype that we talk about the hobo from understanding mm -hmm. way back when I was way, in yeah. the 70s. And there the were hobo. even cartoons. Absolutely. And, you know, they got their little backpack behind mm -hmm. them and they're the hobos and they were, stayed at the train station and went from one place to another to another to mm -hmm. another. Well, that really hasn't changed that much. These are people who are living in very transitional um, modes and going from place to place, but they are that um, population that are marginalized due to mental illness, um, substance abuse, which often is because of a mental illness that can't get addressed through a bogged down system. Mm -hmm. um, there's people dealing with abuse at home, like a woman who yeah. might leave out of abuse and take her children with her. Um, so there's this whole marginalized society that they just start spilling off from different directions to, to really consume the streets. And so you and I might be rubbing shoulders with them very, very frequently and not know it. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And again, my thought was is the mothers that I had seen at the playground with their children, you would never know that the destitute. Did and, you recognize them? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And one of the wow. women I had written a letter to, 
Um, and I had felt compelled to write a letter to her um, in her situation at the homeless shelter before I even saw her at that playground, pretending like we're all normal mm -hmm. mothers with our children at the playground. As I read, especially some of these groups, because she's got a friend society, but there's different kinds of groups within that. Mm -hmm. There, but for the grace of God, go I. Could happen to any of us. Any of us. Any of us. I think uh, one of my favorite stories in the book is about uh, the police detective. Um, and I call him Bud in the book. And he was a high-ranking police chief um, in a very large city. And he happened to be involved in the major bust with the mafia. And the mafia revenge uh, caught up with him and they murdered his wife and his three children. And at that moment, he was gone. And emotionally, I've, I've met him and know him and know of him and where he resides and doesn't speak to people. He doesn't have any emotional um, on his face. He's not re-entered society. And I mean, who would think that the police chief of some major yeah. city yeah. would end up being one of these homeless people, but, but he was. And there are different kinds of facilities um, some of them are for women and children only, and in a way I can see why, but we love men too. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually, I think, a real epidemic shortage of, of the facilities that can assist the mothers and the children. For one, they, these facilities may be able to house them overnight, but there is no daytime security. There is no daycare for their children for them to put them to go look for a job, et cetera. Um, a lot of these facilities are actually like, for instance, the one in the Panhandle is a dorm that is only 12 beds for the whole within a hundred mile radius. And those women stay there and again, if they have a spouse, the spouse is not staying with them. The spouse is sleeping in a car in the parking lot if they're lucky enough to have a car to sleep in. Um, so these facilities, we are really in dire shortage of facilities for families in particular, um, which a lot of churches are actually doing programs of overnight programs, particularly in Denver, when it's cold night shelters where they house the whole family together, um, which is really a blessing mm -hmm. and, and, and a need that needed to be met. Well, um, so there are, there are a lot of facilities across the United States. They can really only sleep there. Mm -hmm. What do they do the rest of the day? Where do they go? Well, everyone sees panhandlers, don't they? Just yeah. about on every corner. Yeah. Um, and so during the day, there are places that they hang out. Um, some of them choose to hang out in strip malls near... Um, a grocery store. There's a man I used to run into at Publix and on my way in he'd be sitting near the door and he'd be like, excuse me ma'am, and I knew him as Ralph and hey Ralph, how you doing? He goes, you know what I need? Me need my pop tops because I can't keep my my can opener in my cart because it falls through the holes and I, you know, need some corned beef hash and um, so they do plot out where they can get their own assistance when they can't um, get it through the system. Um, and there are those who do sleep um, on the streets, um, under the bridges, and in tents. The tent cities are mm -hmm. huge, huge. You know, you hear some, and I've heard it in, true in India, and I've heard people say it here, maybe in New York places. Don't give panhandlers anything. What is your opinion on that? Because I have, I've given to Right. Them. Well, and I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I was speaking to a sixth grade class that we had read uh, the last chapter in the book, which is about um, a teenager who's homeless and what their lives were like. And they got to see a picture of what it would be like as, as a student in, who is homeless and what their challenges are. But the point of going to the sixth grade class is, well, my mom told me, you know, you just give them that money and all they're going to do is go out and buy drugs or alcohol. And so we're yeah, not going to yeah. give them any of that money. Yeah. And it's so sweet to see a six-year-old boy say that, but at the same time you go, but have you ever thought that, who is it us to judge doing that? Who cares what they use it for? Mm -hmm. That dollar, whether they use it for alcohol or substance abuse of some kind, or whether it is to put in the piggy food. bank to get toothpaste for their kids or food, it's the, it's the dignity of giving it to them going, 
this is your choice to do what you want with. Not saying it that way, mm -hmm. but that's what it is to me is it's dignity to them saying, I trust you to do with this what you need. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, um, and I think the Holy Spirit can lead us in every way that we need some direction. Uh, oh, it was, I don't know, months and months ago, I was in a Walmart parking lot. This lady came up to me, she says, I'm a grandmother. She said, I got my grandkids over here. We're gonna be evicted. It was quite a story. Mm. And I, I handed her $5 and, and started to drive out. And uh, <laughs> it was like, boy, were you cheap. <laughs> Because her story rang so true. Mm -hmm. She said she'd been trying to get the church across the street. They weren't open and all. She, well, I'm a grandmother. Mm -hmm. I would do that. Mm -hmm. And yep. so I drove around till I could find her. <laughs> and you're like, here's some more. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, I think the Holy Spirit can lead us in every every way, every step we take all day long. But you know, it's so easy for the enemy to use that to, to, to let you know you didn't do enough. Mm -hmm. And it's, be, I think because of how overwhelming mm -hmm. and because of the epidemic it is, you think my $1 can't make a difference. Yeah. My $5 can't make a difference. My bag of toiletries can't make a difference. And it's so overwhelming. I think that's one of the main reasons why people don't engage mm -hmm. in trying to assist yeah. or learn about it because the enemy's lying to you. Yeah, this lady was so believable. <laughs> just, well, and I even, have no doubt. And She's, even hearing her story, but if you yeah. didn't hear somebody's stories, you know what, in Matthew 25, mm -hmm. 25, 40, he says, you help the least of these, one of these, yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. And you, you did it to me. He doesn't care how many you do it to, just do it to one where you feel the conviction. Yeah, and um, boy, the Bible is so plain. Give and it shall be given unto you. I feel that one of the best securities I have is giving to the Lord. Yeah. The bank could go under tomorrow. We were talking about banks before. <laughs> we were, yes. <laughs> uh, Shame uh, on that's, that. another, that's another subject. If you just join me, I'm talking to my friend Renee Crosby, and she's written this book called The Fringe, A Secret Society. It is all about the homeless, and she describes them. Some of them are short term. Some of them seem to be in for a longer haul. And there, there's a website on the screen, but also remember the name, The Friends. You can go on Amazon and get it. I really uh, recommend this for any Christian, any Christian, get your eyes open, but also for pastors and church leaders, because I have a hunch they, that these good people don't know any more about than I did. And you uh, really, truly did educate me. Now, um, are there those who just they kind of give in to a mental thing like, I can live this way. Because I, I met one person like that. It was pretty close to me. Like, yeah, I can do this. Absolutely. Um, there was a gentleman, and he just recently passed away. And somebody sent me his story because he lived in Florida. And he chose to live on the streets this way. And he himself proclaimed himself an advocate for those who didn't have a voice because he's like, I have a strong enough voice to mm -hmm. um, help deal with some of the judicial problems and tickets and loitering and the overmass we get in the judicial system from these frivolous things that But happen. he found that he found a certain uh, contentment. He did. Yeah. It was his calling. Mm -hmm. And people say, oh, he chose to be that way. Well, yeah, so what if he did? Do you know what this, judge? this gave me uh, an appreciation because you hear about these groups who say, oh, we, we want your good clothes that you're going to give away and you can help a, a woman enter into the workforce again. Right. Uh, those are out there. I don't have a name for one now, but pay attention to it because <clears throat> how can they reenter society? Well, you know, that's one of the biggest national questions that I think um, all coalitions are trying to determine. And I think the answer most, almost all of them come to is housing first. You have to get them in the housing and the stable. And if we're talking a tiny house village like they're doing in Denver, there might be 18 houses that would house a, a woman with her three children or with her spouse, housing first. You have your address to apply for jobs. Mm -hmm. You have your place to go home to at night. You have running water to take showers. 
and housing first is really, really key to getting these people re-entered into stable society. Do you know some happy endings? I know a lot of happy endings. Good. I do. Yeah. I do. One of them was in the book about the couple who stayed at the uh, shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, the woman and children were in the dorm and the man was one of the ones who slept at night in the car. And Boy, that must have been something. They, That's worth the book. <laughs> it, it, they alone were an amazing story. They loved each mm -hmm. other and they are uh, in their own home. They are functional. They have their jobs. They, they were a temporary situation, which is the key is that six months. If you get them past six months of living in those kind of dire, can't get back on their feet, they slip into that long-term homeless um, problem mm -hmm. that we have. You say that 40% of the homeless men are vets. Yes. I tell you, that was like a stab in my heart. There ought to be some system to transition vets to you would think. working you would think. jobs. I, and I have heard of companies, I, heard, I, I wish I could name it to give it some credit, but a big company who was uh, really going to major on hiring mm -hmm. uh, veterans. Because mm -hmm. some of them go in when they're uh, very young, teenagers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they come out and that's all they know. Yes, And they kind of need to be retrained. The retraining is an issue. I think a, a lot of that 40% though is that older generation of the Vietnam vets and the mental health problems that they have. And like for instance, I know of several that in a town to get their first appointment, to get the proper medical mm -hmm. evaluation, yeah. to get on the proper medical um, medication mm -hmm. that they needed to be stable, mm -hmm. three months wait to get that appointment. Yeah. And you yeah. know, you, you can't serve a population like that and expect mm -hmm. them to stay in that area for three months and get that kind of medication to get emotionally stable so that they can go well, further. Well, our time is up, but I believe you've written a book uh, first and foremost, to educate and also to uh, wake up the Christian community. Um, what can you do? I mean, you went to a soup kitchen, God bless you. And I know that a lot of good Christians and churches are involved in those, mm -hmm. but I hope that from now on, we might be a little bit more prone to recognize these situations. According to her statistics, one child out of every 30 homeless and look around just be a little bit more aware and see what we can do and most of all show that kindness and extend it that Jesus has given to us it's so important please join me next time remembering there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper God bless you if you should miss a homekeepers program you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com click on CTN programs and then on homekeepers 